Every person I know eventually comes to this place and they, they say to someone, I don't understand me. I don't understand why I do what I do. And then he'll go on to just say, I hate it. And I hate that about me. And if you're a Christ follower, it kills you when you, when you sin. Because you say to yourself, I don't want to hurt the heart of God. Now I get it. Those who don't follow Christ, never think about it. It's not on their radar. Never concerns them, never bothers you. Which, by the way, if, if your sin has never bothered you, you should ask yourself, am I really a Christ follower? Because a true follower of Christ is deeply troubled by those dark places in your life that we call sin. Our chapter in Romans this morning addresses this. In Romans chapter 7, if you have your Bibles with you, I would love for you to open to it. I'm not actually putting the verses on the screen today. And one of the things I love when you follow along in your Bibles is that you're able to circle specific verses or just see where they're at and go back and look at them. I won't read every verse in this chapter this week. I want to thank you for working through this book with me. A lot of the books of the Bible, they tell stories and you can really get drawn into the story. This is like a legal brief. And the Apostle Paul was like that. And one thing builds on the other. And when he's not convinced you've gotten it yet, he circles back and comes at it from another angle. So when you're reading through, sometimes you're like, didn't we already talk about this? Didn't he already say this? And yet one of the things that we're going to find is the reason he has to keep on saying this is because the people he was writing to at that time, and I believe those of us here today, we're still struggling with the same things. And we have the same objections, and so he'll back up and come at it from a different angle. So let me just walk through the book of Romans with you. If you haven't been here with us, uh, you can go back and listen to all the um, sermons, but I can bring you up to speed really fast here this morning. If you have been with us, this is a great way to just sort of remember what's been there. We're going to put a couple of these words up on the screen so you can just remember what these chapters were about. Chapters 1 and 2. Paul works really, really hard to get us all lost. That sounds weird, but the fact of the matter is we all think we're fine. And so he starts out with the heathen, and we all go, yeah, we knew they were lost. He says, yeah, they're lost, and they're guilty before God. And then he goes to the moral person, like, whoa, 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 whoa. I, I thought they were okay. Well, he says, no, your works aren't going to get you to God, so yeah, they're lost too, and they're accountable before God. And they're standing back, looking on, and they're saying, yeah, but we're religious. We have a special position. We have a special title. And God says, no. You're lost too. You're fallen. You're accountable before God. And in chapter 3 of this book, he says, every one of us, the whole world, the only way we're going to get saved, the only way we're going to come to God is through faith. And that was a real dilemma to the Jewish folks that this was being written to um, when Paul was originally writing it because they really found themselves wanting to get to God by doing all sorts of good works. And they had 613 laws and they were working really hard to try to define what they were and how to get around them so that the loopholes were figured out so they could figure out how they could just get to God through those works. And so now all of a sudden we're saying, no, it's not that, it's faith. And they weren't doing real well with that. By the way, we struggle with the same thing in our day. In fact, that's religion. It's all about how I work my way to God. Um, what we're going to talk about today is how God came to us in the person of Jesus. Chapter 4, they're still struggling with this, so he decides to give them an illustration. And he uses a guy by the name of Abraham, who was a historical figure at that time, but whom they traced their DNA back to, and they held him in high esteem. He was their hero of all heroes. And he says, let's talk about Abraham for a minute. Before these laws ever came into being, Abraham obeyed God. And he says, and God called that righteousness. 
So it wasn't because of him following rules or doing all of these works. It was he had faith in what God says. When God said it, he believed it. He had faith in it. said, okay, God, here we go. And that is chapter 4. He goes on to chapter 5 to say, this is how you get saved. And so he, all this is just one long writing that he's trying to walk us through. So he, he gives us this explanation. We were represented or are represented by Adam. We all come from Adam. And as a result of Adam, Adam sinned and he represented us and that sin was passed on to us. As a result of that sin, all the brokenness that we see in the world today was passed on to us and all the darkness and sinfulness is passed on to us. You're like, who wants all of that? But that's who we were represented by. He said, then, then we have a choice. God sends his son Jesus to represent us by dying on a cross and taking our punishment for this darkness and for this sin on himself. And Jesus says, I will represent you before God the Father, and because of what I did for you, he will see you as righteous. But you've got to choose. And chapter 5 talks about switching our allegiance from Adam to Jesus. And that's a choice that each of us are left to make at a given point when we change that allegiance. Chapter 6 describes the Christian life and how it works. And by the way, I see it as a turning point in the book. It gets a lot more practical. It gets a, a lot easier moving forward because it begins to deal with the real issues that we're dealing with rather than this big, huge philosophical issue of sin where you, uh, you just keep on going, wow, do I need to hear about sin one more time? He goes, yeah, because you haven't gotten it yet. He gives us the practical issues of how to live out the Christian life. And in this chapter, chapter 6, he says, as a Christian, here's what happened to you. When you put your trust in Jesus, you actually were identified with him. You were identified with him in his death. So when you put your trust in Jesus, it's as if you died with him. You were identified with him in his death. You were identified with him in his burial. Your sins were buried. And you were identified with him in the resurrection to new life. And as he explains it, in fact, in two weeks, on Memorial Day weekend, on Sunday when we have that one service at 10, we're also going to have baptisms that day. It's the same picture there. We say to everyone in this room, I was identified with Jesus, and so I am identified with his death, going under the water, his burial, and with his resurrection to, to new life in Jesus. So as, as, we, as we get that, or at the end of chapter 6, there's a verse that I feel is important that we just end this little summary with. It's 623. And if you've never looked at this verse, or if it's not underlined in your Bible, this is one that's worthwhile having underlined in your Bible. It says this, for the wages of sin is death. So we say the results of sin, the price of sin, where sin's going to lead is ultimately going to lead to death. We think of death as a body in a coffin, a body being placed in the grave of a funeral. Um, in, in his time, what he is really drawing a picture of is what takes place at the time of death. It's a separation of a relationship. So whoever it is that has died, you no longer have the opportunity to interact with them, to relate with them. In this case, what he's trying to explain to us is that when Adam sinned, and when that sin came to all of us, and we were represented by that sin, we were separated in relationship with God. And that should trouble each one of us um, a lot because we're no longer in relationship with God. And he says, but, and this is huge, you ought to circle the word but, the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So if that relationship has been severed because of death, how do I have a relationship with God? I need to get that 
free gift of God through Jesus Christ. It is only in Jesus. It is never by works. That's why he makes it clear there, free. It's why he says gift. It's not something you can earn or deserve. It's not something that you can accomplish. It's something that can only come through Jesus Christ. I got word just a little bit ago that Pastor Mike has just returned from Senegal with the team. I guess they landed this morning. I wouldn't be surprised if he's in the room. Is he in the room? He's the type, yeah, he is. Of course he is. I always point him out. He normally is sitting over here, but he's somewhere back there. The Sese back there, the team's back there. It just blows me away. I mean, if I flew all 12, 18 hours, I'm not godly enough to come into church. So bless you. Love you guys. And um, you'll hear from them more and more. But I, I was following them on Facebook this week. Pastor Mike wrote um, some stuff back to me. But one of the things that I love about what they do there is they don't just go do a bunch of good works. I, oftentimes there's this tendency to say, hey, we're going to go do a bunch of nice things for these people, but let's not mess with their religion. That sort of messes up the social structures of their world. We'll just be good people. And um, what they do is they go there. If you, if you hang around this team ever, this is what you're going to find. And, and I, I encourage you to go on it. They'll take and they'll deliver soap to everyone over there. And then they begin to talk about, hey, this will get you clean for a couple nights until it runs out. But let me tell you how you can be clean for eternity. They, they'll take them rice and they'll hand out rice and say, hey, this will feed you. But there's, there's food that you need that's way more important than, the, than this food that, that'll be gone soon. And they tell them about Jesus. And I believe it's like so incredibly important to realize that it is only in Jesus that we're saved. That's why I love the way we do missions here. We insist that whoever is taking the gospel out beyond here, that they tell them about Jesus. It's why we love giving to these things here. It's why we love that church that, um, are, uh, that is being built over there in Goliath right now, that our church has funded. The gospel is going to go out from there to tell people that the only way you can have a right relationship with God is to get that free gift through Jesus alone. There's no other way. The only way to God is through Jesus Christ. And we argue, but they're good people. I've been around them, and they're like really, really good people. I'm sure they're fine. And what our Bible tells us is if they don't have Jesus, they're not fine. The reason we argue this is because we still struggle with this mentality that if you do a certain level of good works, that probably you're okay. And so we like to justify it by looking at those people and going, they do some good things, right? And there's a lot of things they're not doing that's really bad, so that it must be okay, and God's going to be okay. Religion says, this is how I work my way to God. What I love about what the Bible says and what grace is, Jesus came to me. And we want to bring Jesus to these folks. Now, again, the problem here is we keep on going back to this law. And chapter 7 is going to explain to us why we're not under that law anymore. So let me just start reading 7.1. Or do you not know brothers? And so originally he was writing here to a Jewish audience, so he's writing to the Jewish people. He says, for I am speaking to those of you who know the law. That's that 613 laws of Moses, 10 of those being the 10 commandments that they were working really, really, really hard to, to fulfill. He says that law is binding on a person only as long as he lives. So he says all those laws, those 613 laws, they're, they're only going to work for you as long as you live. So you think about it for a moment. If you're going to leave here today, you get on the turnpike. Uh, the law is that you drive, I don't know, is it 65 or 75 on the turnpike? <laughs> None of us look anymore. We just hope for the best. Um, but let's just say it's 65. But if you don't make it to the turnpike because you die between now and then, that 65 mile an hour speed limit doesn't apply to you. So he says, if you die... These laws don't apply to you. And then he goes into an illustration, and if you wish, you could read it in the next couple of verses, and the illustration is that of marriage. And he's just picking any one of the laws, and he's just using it to illustrate this point of view. So he says, listen, if, if a couple is married together, they have made a commitment to stay together and live as a married couple. He says if one of them would separate and go do their thing, that that would be considered adultery. 
But he says, if they're married together and one of them dies, this one's free to go do whatever they want because they're no longer bound by this marital relationship and it would not be an adultery for them to go meet someone else. And you go, okay, um, help me a little bit. Where's he going with this? If you have your Bibles open, look at verse 4. He goes, so likewise. He just gave the illustration. My brothers, you have also died to the law. You remember when I just told you a little bit ago in chapter 6, we became identified with Christ, and when we became identified with him, we died. And he says, when that happened, we died to the law through the body of Christ so that you may belong to another. To whom? To him. To Jesus, who has been raised from the dead, in order that we may bear fruit for God. So no longer do we do these works that ultimately do not get us to God. Ultimately, we die to those works, and we now bear fruit because of Jesus and his resurrection, and that changes us. Verse 5, for while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law, I'll explain that in a little bit, were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. And then he says this, but now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve in a new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. So he says now, here's what's happened. You have died to the law. You've died to these rules so that you can now have the Spirit of God in your life that you're going to live according to the Spirit of God. So you're not going to bear the fruit of death. When you live with Adam, when you have his representation, you do whatever death asks for. And that's why there's such a mess in this world, because everyone that's represented by Adam is out there living it to the fullest and living out death every day to its fullest. He says, when we've changed that allegiance, we now live for Christ, and a new way has come so that we can serve in a new way. We're no longer living to the principle of death. We're now living to the principle of life. And what God does in through us through the Spirit creates a fruit and a result that is unbelievable. But it only comes as a result of him. Over here, we're represented by death. Here's what happens. We live by fear. If I do these couple things right, if I, if I try to do better and better and better, I'll, I'll do well. And then all of a sudden you do those things and you do this little work around and then you miss one and you miss another. All of a sudden you go, wait a minute, am I going to get slapped down by God? Is, is, is this bad thing happening because God's angry with me? And you're never sure and you're never certain and you live your life in fear. Fear that God is going to discipline you. And you only do what you do because you're afraid of God. And that's not how God wants it to be. Up to the cross, fear was the relationship. After the cross, we live in a new way. Fear has been renewed, removed. And the Spirit of God has come into our lives. Look at verse 6. So that we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. So let's talk about that old way of the written code. Because the next couple verses go into that. And in the next few verses, I'm just going to summarize them for you really quickly. They basically say, so are you saying that the law, those 613 um, laws of Moses, are they bad? Are they sin? And here's what he says. Um, yeah, there's a bad side to them and there's a good side to them. He says, here's the good side to them. The good side to them is, is that by knowing how sinful we are, we know we want and we need a Savior. The bad side is, is when all of a sudden we found this law, we realized it sort of inflamed something in us that made us want it. So, it. so here's the deal. If there was one room in this church that they said, Lee, um, I know you're senior pastor, but this one room you can't go into, that would really irritate me. Because I just, I, I don't know, I, I, I want to be able to know that I can go anywhere and everywhere all the time. And I would be doing all sorts of things to find a way into that room. 
I'd probably stake myself out down the hall watching for someone to um, leave the door, just open a crack, and I would dart in there to see what was in that room. There would be something inside of me that would be inflamed that I wanted inside of that room. And I, and I would chase that down until I got inside of that room. Um, those of us who have had kids, we recognize what that's like. You tell them no, and all of a sudden, they just got to go touch it. They got to go grab it. They got to go play with it. You go, you got to be kidding. Of everything you can play with in this house, you now have to go play with my favorite vase. But the moment we told them no, it was like they couldn't keep their fingers off of that thing. That's what the law does. It inflames that. But it makes us realize at the end of the day how much we need a Savior. One of the things that every week that is so heavy on my heart when I leave here is I think there are a lot of people that leave here saying, ah, I'm fine. I'm pretty good. Uh, it, it'll be okay. And I recognize there are people that leave here every week that they'll never walk back into this room again. God will never give them another opportunity to hear the gospel message. There are people that something will happen that week that they'll actually die that week and enter into eternity that week. And they walk out of here going, eh, it's cool, it's good. In fact, I, I think I'm pretty good. I mean, I actually went to church today and, you know, I, I, I didn't throw a 20 in that bucket. I threw a 100 in there. It was by mistake, but I threw it in there anyhow. I sort of regret that, but, but hey, you know, hopefully God's happy now. I talked to someone on the way out. Did I get extra points for that? And, and you leave there with all these lists of things that we think, man, if I did those things that, that, I've got, that I'm okay with God. And my, my fear is that people will leave here um, going, I'm all right. I'm good enough. As opposed to saying, I need a Savior. I need Jesus. For the first, um, well, first service, I said, for the first 10 years of my marriage, my wife didn't sleep. Anyone have any ideas why? I snored really loud. Now, she had corrected me in between services that it wasn't 10 years. It was the first 15 years of our marriage she didn't sleep. She wants full credit and full credit given now. For the first 15 years of my marriage, she did not sleep because I snored really, really, really loud. Someone told me in between service she should have gotten earplugs. I said, I tried that. She didn't think they worked. I snored that loud that even earplugs were penetrated by my snoring. I guess everything in the room even rattled. Dishes on the counters rattled. It was terrible. And she finally, after 15 years, decides to take things into her own hands. I didn't really understand that because I said, I don't have a problem. And I mean this with everything inside of me. I have always slept like a baby. I lay my head in the pillow. My eyes go closed. I am sound asleep. I could lay on that front row right now with all of you sitting in here, close my eyes, I'd be out cold, sound asleep. I have zero problem sleeping, but she now thinks she needs to take me to a sleep doctor. I protest, but it wasn't worth it. I got the 15-year talk. I forgot it was 15, but I got the 15-year talk, and off to the doctor we went. She picked a doctor that had a financial motive in this. He has a sleep lab attached to his doctor's office, and so immediately he said, oh, yeah, I'm sure you have a problem, and he says, I'm going to book you for next week. Come in for a sleep test. And so she waits for yet one, 15 years and one week um, to, to put up with this. I go into the sleep lab to get this test, and they hook me up to wires, head to toe, stuff on my, on, in my head. I mean, stuff everywhere, stuff. Uh, it was crazy. I mean, this looked like a science experiment. And as, um, as, I, as I laid down, they told me, and we have cameras all around. We'll be watching you all night. Oh, great. You know? But I told you, I sleep fine, and I don't have a problem, so I closed my eyes and went to sleep. Not a problem even with all those wires hooked up, even with doctors and nurses scrambling all around in the distance and video cameras on me. So anyhow, um, two hours later... Um, they're coming in and they're waking me up. You got to wake up. You got to wake up. You got to wake up. Oh my goodness. Is it morning? It's morning. No, it's only two hours. 
Well, why are you waking me up then? You're not breathing. I go, yeah, I'm breathing. I'm sleeping fine. I was having no problems. You saw how quick I went to sleep. No, you're not like breathing like most of the time. This is emergency. This is deadly. I'm like, well, you know, I, I forget what it was at the time, but I, I've lived this many years. I'm just fine. It, it can't be that bad. And you know, You're freaking out. I slept through the night last night and didn't die. And, and all this kind of stuff. And, and so they're like, well, here's, here's, what, here's what we're going to do is we're actually going to put a mask on you and um, that's actually going to put um, air into your head and it's going to open up your whatever passages and keep you breathing tonight and you'll breathe just fine. I said, fine, just let me go back to sleep. So they pop this thing back on me and I go sound asleep, boom, like that. I wake up in the morning, they're waking me up and I'm like, oh my goodness, I am a new man. I never felt like that when I woke up. I thought everyone woke up with a headache and with this deep throbbing in the back of the head. I didn't realize. I thought everyone's eyes felt like they were 10 times bigger than normal when they woke up in the morning. I thought everyone's throat just felt constricted in the morning. I wake up that morning. I'm like, oh, my goodness. They take the stuff off of me. and They were like, you got, we have to order you up this special machine, and you've got to promise you'll use it. We're going to put a rush on it. We're going to get it right to you. And I go home, I had never had this much energy. It was like high octane for the entire day. I was like the Energizer Bunny. It was fun, (laughs) awesome, it was game changing. I would never, ever, I, I've missed one night since then. That was when I flew to Senegal. I got to figure out a way to do it, um, have it on my head in a plane in the future or do a day trip because I, this whole sleeping thing without a machine is impossible 10 years since then. Almost 25 years of marriage now. She has slept for the last 10 years and um, she's a happy lady now. Hey, here's why I tell you all that. I was sure I didn't have a problem. And we can go through all these weeks of God telling us in his book, in his words, saying we're sinners and we need a savior and we need to trust him by faith and works won't get it done. And we still walk out here going, I'm fine. My heart is heavy over that. So four or five weeks ago, I went to my doctor here for the sleep doctor, a different doctor. She doesn't have a lab attached to her office, so I haven't been drugged back in for any more tests. I like that. My machine was like dying, and I needed a new machine, and so she provided that for me. And before I left, she says, you need to make an appointment for eight, eight weeks from now for, to come back in here. I said, what's that for? And my cynical nature says, billing. She says, the reason I have to come back in is to make sure that I am compliant. I said, what, what do you mean, compliant? Well, that you're using it every night. I said, you know I use this thing every night. I've only missed one night in 15 years, and I regret it to this day. And I said, you know, I, so do I still have to come? She goes, yeah. Cynical nature says, billing. I said, why do I need to come? She goes, well, the insurance companies require it. Why do they require it? She says, because so many people get these machines, and they never use them. I had a family stop me in the back right after first service Grandma's standing there like, thank you. She never uses her machine. (laughs) And I asked myself, how in the world could you not use your machine when you wake up in the morning feeling like a new person, like an energizer bunny, when you can breathe all night long and you're not gasping for air every couple seconds to try to stay alive? How could you not use your machine? There's people in here going, "I, I, I don't use mine half the time either. That's not the point. When you have the opportunity to have the fruit of life as opposed to the fruit of death, the thing that everyone is so frustrated with in this world, all the anger and hate and bitterness and malice, how you're always having to check your rearview mirror at all times because someone's about ready to do harm to you, you're so tired of that death You can transfer that allegiance to Jesus and have that life. Why would you not? Oh, I beg you, if you're sitting here today and you've walked out of here saying you're fine many times, there is something weird about our brains that tell us we're fine. I told my wife for 15 years, I'm fine. And even now, I translate it as only 10. And I just tell you, please, if you've never put your trust in Jesus, It is the best thing that I ever did. 
I talk to people in this room all the time that say, I am so glad I have Jesus in my life. And it's as easy as right now stopping right here in this moment and saying, Jesus, yeah, I get that. I'm tired of trying to earn it on my own. I'm trying to get there on my own. Jesus, I trust you right now. It's not some ceremony you have to go through. It's not some sort of thing you got, hope you got to jump through. This is a conversation between you and the God of the universe who came to save you. He says, he who has the Son has life. He who has did not have the Son has not life. Put your trust in him right now and say, yes, Jesus. Now listen, for a whole bunch in this room who have put your trust in Jesus, there is a little caveat that you struggle with. You know you put your trust in Jesus, but you've been feeling bad ever since I opened up by making that comment, why do I do this? I hate this about me. And you figure, just like the whole fear thing that we talked about a few moments ago, this is the thing that God's going to finally nail you on, and it troubles you deeply. I want to tell you today something that is so important. The Apostle Paul, who wrote this book, speaks about this very thing. If you have your Bible open, you've got to read this. Some of these verses you've quoted before, you've heard this before. This is a guy that wrote much of your New Testament saying that, 715. For I do not understand my own actions. Here he goes. I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know nothing good dwells in me. That is in my flesh. That's key phrase. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. Key words again. It's not, it's sin in me. Even though I'm saved, I carry around this body of flesh. That's what Paul's saying. You're still stuck with this flesh that is still somehow impacted by sin. And so he says in verse 21, so I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. Is anyone connected with that? Anyone say, yep, yep, yep. Hate that? Do you hate that? Verse 22, he says, I delight in the law of God. I want to please God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law in my mind, making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members, in me again. And then he says this, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? So understand, this is a Christian talking This is the man who wrote much of your New Testament talking. This is inspired by God, and he says, Christian, as long as you're walking on this earth, you do carry with you the flesh. And as long as you're carrying that with you, you're going to struggle with sin until you're separated from this body and you're in heaven with Jesus. And I just... I want to throw out some solutions to this struggle right now. The first one is this. Don't be surprised. Romans 3.23, Romans 5.12 says this. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. 5.12. As by one sin, uh, some one man's sin came into the world, all have sinned. Don't be surprised. Don't be caught off guard by this. And don't deny that it's happening. Realize it. I understand that we are all being faced with it on a dev- everyday basis. Hey, listen, don't be dismissive of it. There are some who would say, no, no, that's, that's not actually happening. And the enemy would like us to be blind to it. But the scriptures say we need to deal with that. What I love with the Apostle Paul when he says, oh, what a wretched man am I who can deliver me from this body of death. What I love is his soft heart. Throughout the New Testament of your Bible, 
The Bible talks about having a soft heart. Remember I started out, I said, if you're not a believer, if you're not a Christ follower, sin doesn't matter to you. And you're like, I don't know why anyone matters. I mean, that's fun. That's what we do. That's how we live our lives. For those who are a believer, it troubles them deeply. And for those with a soft heart, God, I didn't want to live like this. And he's saying, how do I get out of this? Understand, we all have an enemy. And just because you put your trust in Christ does not mean that enemy is totally gone now. It does not mean you don't still carry along this body of flesh. Second of all, I believe we need to be encouraged that a guy by the name of the Apostle Paul says, this is my problem. Now, here, here's a little caveat to that. In the back of my mind, when the guy who writes the Bible, I mean, not many people ever get to write the Bible. They're only a very limited amount, and they're not adding to it. When the guy that gets to write the Bible says, oh, man, I'm a bad sinner. Have you ever had one of these people tell you they're a bad sinner, and you're thinking, yeah, what did you do? Think a bad thought once. You went 66 in a 65. Yeah, wow, you're horrible. I'm so sorry. Oh, no, if you break one law, you've broken them all. Yeah, I get it. And you're thinking, man, I know who I am. I know where I'm at. We think of the Apostle Paul. We think he probably did one of those just like minute things, and he's just sort of overreacting to this because he's such an amazing guy. But look at me. Look at my thing. Look at my things. I, I, I need a tractor trailer to hold, uh, hold my thoughts and my um, temptations towards sin. And maybe I'd come at it a different way. And I don't know if this is okay to do, but take, take the Apostle Paul, and rather than assuming that he went 66 and a 65, think of the worst sin that can come to your mind and put that on this. What if he's the one saying, I am struggling with that sin? What if he's saying, I'm tempted by that sin? And I just want you to be encouraged because here's a man of God saying, this fleshy mess that I drag around, even though my heart has been changed and the Spirit of God is in me, is all in the process of being renewed, and it is hard. And that's why I, I just want to keep on saying to you, be in fellowship, be with each other. Because what I, I see so often is people say, yeah, I don't go to your church anymore. You know what happened with and they'll name a situation or a person or a sin. And they'll say, you know, I'm not being in a church like that. Really? We need each other because we are sinners. Because we all carry around this body of flesh. And we need to be bringing Jesus to each other. And we need to be encouraging each other and um, pushing each other along. In fact, I don't know if you heard this this morning. When Rob spoke here a little bit ago about the men's retreat, you remember what he said was the best part of the retreat? Driving up and back. I think he saved some money on the retreat or the conference. What? He saved some money on it, just drive up and back. <laughs> just round trip, be with the guys. And the bottom line is, is we need each other. It helps me so much when I hear Paul say, I'm struggling with this too. I go, praise God. I just thought I was that only one. And by the way, next week, he's going to give us more solutions to this. So at the beginning of chapter 8, the very first thing that, that he says is, he says, there's no condemnation for those who are in Jesus. I'm like, oh, wow, good. Because when you're feeling this big body of flesh that you're dragging along, there is just this ongoing condemnation that comes just beating on you, saying you're no good. One last thing because it's the last thing in this chapter. We'll go to chapter 8 next week, but I want to give you this last thing. Worship team, you can come up right now. We can help each other put our eyes on Jesus. Let me read this verse here to you. So right after he says, Help! What a wretched man am I! Who can deliver me this from this body of death? Look down to verse 25. Look what it says. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. You see, that's why we're always saying it's all about Jesus. That's why we're always drawing you back to Jesus. Because we have left fear. We have left death. And love has come down. Jesus has come. And he has given us that unconditional love. And, and we read these words. We hear Paul's words. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Put our eyes on Jesus. Help others turn their eyes towards Jesus. Tell them they need Jesus. Tell them they need to grab onto Jesus. Give them more of Jesus. We need to be a Jesus people here at Calvary. 
I'll leave you with this final statement. Have so much Jesus in you that those around see more Jesus and less you. I want people to see more and more and more Jesus in me. Because this body of flesh, there's a lot of me being hauled around, and I just got to hold Jesus up. Pray for you as you do that. Jesus, we invite you into our lives. For those who have never done that before, and putting their trust in you for the first time, we say, Jesus, forgive us of our sins. Come into our lives. We want you to shine through. For those of us dragging that body of flesh around right now, feeling very much like, why do I keep on going down this path again? Jesus, I would ask that you would just overcome our lives right now, that you would just take over. And that when people look at us, they hear the name of Jesus on our lips. They see us praying to you, Jesus. They see us calling upon the name of Jesus. They see us grabbing your hand. Jesus, come into our lives, invade our worlds this week. Encourage each person here in Jesus' name. Amen.